Hello, and welcome to another episode of Open Studio. I'm your host, Martina Flor, and in this show, I have honest conversations with artists, designers, and creatives to uncover their story and the specific tactics they use to build a successful career around their skills and the work they love doing. My guest today is Petra Eriksson. Petra is an artist and illustrator born in Stockholm. Petra took a journey via Dublin, Malta, Berlin, and Barcelona, and her work is littered with these eclectic references she picked up along the way. Petra studied graphic design at the renowned Burke's School of Communication before venturing into the world of freelance illustration. Her bold and colorful work, often dotted with confetti and other abstract compositions, have become her signature style. She is especially renowned for her portraits of women. In this conversation with Petra, you will hear about her long and winding road to discovering what she wanted to do creatively and the steps she took before going full-time freelancer. She spoke about the things that gave her leverage as an artist, how she got her first assignments, including the specific wording she used to do client outreach. Petra had relocated cities several times and gave insights into the challenges of joining a new creative community as well as the various gains she had through that in both her professional and personal life. In this episode, you will hear from an artist self-described as an introvert that nevertheless managed to put herself out there and gain a strong place in the contemporary scene of commercial illustration. Enjoy the conversation with Petra Eriksson. Hi, Petra. So good to have Hi, you on the Martina. podcast. <laughs> so nice to be here. I'm really looking forward to this. <laughs> Amazing. Petra, by looking at your work and portfolio, you know, everybody can see that you have produced an immense amount of work. Your work is also very personal and recognizable. And you make a living as a full-time illustrator right now, right? Exactly. So I yeah. normally like to start with a straightforward question. And is this... How does an artist stand out in the crowd with their work? Hmm. I mean, I think, I guess the most important thing is to just find something that feels authentic for you. And because I think in, in the end that that shines through, that you're like enjoying what you're doing and that you have found low in where you feel like happy and good creating your things um, and and I think also like as with kind of everything that you also need to you know spend a lot of time mm -hmm. processing and like working on your skills and just yeah diving deeper into all of these things that you you want to pursue and yeah i think a mix of those things is something that at least is very helpful to create art that like stands out and reflects you and your personality it's interesting because in the previous podcast that i recorded with karan singh i don't know if you know him as an illustrator yeah, from I australia do. and he was saying that um, he was saying something like you cannot fabricate authenticity mm -hmm. and you, you mentioned the same thing right now. So I, I was wondering, like, how do you know if something is authentic? Because I know that many artists and designers that are listening right now to this podcast, they're wondering like, yeah, that's, that makes a lot of sense. But mm -hmm. when you're just starting, you're, you know, trying out a lot of different things and, mm -hmm. you know, how do you identify what is authentic to you? What, you know? Um, what is what is work that is really personal and that is really mm -hmm. coming from you and it's not you know influenced by other things out there or it's not a copy a copy of something that you have seen out there so how how in a way how was the process for you to understand what is authentic for you what is what is the work that is really authentic with Petra mm. it is a very interesting question I mean I think because I think, I mean, to some degree, we all find influences from other places mm -hmm. and other people, especially when we're like starting out and figuring out how to work. Uh, I feel like for me, like it, it came more through through that process of like creating a lot of 
a lot of work and just experimenting a lot initially until I started finding a way of drawing and creating artworks and working with colors that felt in a sense natural to me uh, even though that I, I guess it's it's always tricky to I feel explain these kind of feelings because part of it is like a gut feeling mm. in a sense and 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 I know also like that gut feeling is partly just based on experience of trying a lot of things mm. out and then eventually reaching a state of something that yeah resonates with you um, or at least that was my feeling that like I spent I spent a couple of years while I was working as a designer for a company where like my my creative work within that company was fairly um strict in form in its style and it wasn't I really enjoyed it, but it wasn't like, I, I felt like it wasn't my natural way of expressing myself. So mm. then I spent quite a lot of time, free time on the side of that work, just experimenting more with like creating my own things. And then I tried, yeah, a lot of different ways, but eventually there are things that I just, yeah, kept realizing that I kept coming back to mm. that I wanted to explore more or things that I just yeah picked up during those like trial and errors and experiments that I wanted to continue with and but then I think also you know like your your style it, it keeps evolving mm. after like throughout time but yeah I think for me the offense is authenticity is a lot connected to just yeah kind of gut feeling and yeah yeah something like that <laughs> it's interesting because you mentioned that in a way you were finding patterns you were producing a lot of work experimenting a lot but you were in mm -hmm. a way identifying patterns that you were coming back to and for this is really it seems really necessary to to produce that amount of work so that you can identify mm -hmm. those patterns because if you just produce a couple of different pieces and experiment here and there a little bit it's very hard to to understand where are the common topics and the common shapes and the common colors that you mm. keep coming back to right so yeah exactly no I think that is one of the key things just like spending a lot of hours creating mm. stuff and being like immersing yourself in these creative worlds and yeah feel, seeing what comes out of that and what you yourself feel most connected to the the famous ten thousand hours of work that you need to invest into something <laughs> yeah, exactly. to to actually master it. So before we get in deeper into you know your different experiences, you mentioned that you work at a company as a designer first, and I really want to dig deeper into that. But before we get into that, I would like to back up a little bit and yeah. and go to the roots of your story. So how <laughs> was your life growing up, and what does your family look like? So I grew up in Stockholm in Sweden mm -hmm. with my mom. Um, so we were like our family in a sense was really small. It was basically her, me and our rabbit. <laughs> um, but and, and my dad didn't really come into like the picture for me until I was around 10. And mm -hmm. that has been like a process in itself of building a relationship with him later in life. But um, my mom is a very social person. So I felt like we had, there was a big like kind of extended family because we have like my aunt and cousins and other family members, but there we have been pretty spread out in different parts of Sweden. So in my day-to-day -day life, my like the close family to us were more like that kind of 
extended family mm. of her friends and their kids and like my godmother and yeah other people that belonged into that Stockholm life and my mom she just she actually used to work as a graphic designer as well but then she switched her career to work as a social worker when I was a kid but it will in, in many ways like she she's kept being a creative person and we lived in a home that was decorated with a lot of like design objects and colors and prints and the paintings and yeah very a, a little bit of a, like a creative chaos but I can see now that uh, that is something that has also really inspired my own way of like looking at shapes and colors and a lot of things that I see in her home now that are some of the things that we had when I was a kid as well that I can kind of see creeping back into my creative worlds now. And that's pretty interesting that you had a, a graphic designer mom because that that wasn't like a career choice until our generation, I would say, right? Or, or like newer generations, right? So I think that's really particular of your own past. So I, I can imagine that when you when you said to your mom that you were going to study graphic design, because I know that you went to art school, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So th that wasn't a surprise for her. What was her reaction to to you choosing that, going down this path? I mean, my mom has always been, she's also a person that is very like straightforward and realistic. And I, I've kind of always been very creative. And as a kid, I was very shy and spent a lot of time just like you know like reading drawing being in my own little like peaceful bubble somewhere mm -hmm. um so i i think from like or i know from a pretty early age that i was like oh like something visually creative like mm. i'm like drawn to this world um, and this might be something that I want to, you know, explore as a career later. And she was always pretty, like very straightforward and she was like, yeah, like I really want you to test out whatever you want to try out. And But, you know, like this, if you want to be an artist or designer, it can also be, you know, tricky to get into this, but if you you know, if you dedicate yourself and if this is what you want to do, you should test it out and, uh, you know, work on some other things on the side to save some money. But <laughs> yeah, very practical as well. Um, but yeah, no, like I, I definitely feel like there was a good support from her mm. and in just, yeah, wanting me to test whatever I wanted and... I think since she had also been doing that herself, even though her kind of graphic design career was not as, I would say, not as freely creative as we have it now. Like she worked with like a, you know, a very few amount of clients and it was, well, a completely different process basically of mm -hmm. working when it was like before the digital uh world kicked off oh my um, god brave yeah. all by yeah. pasting and cutting <laughs> and drawing by hand and all that exactly <laughs> exactly yeah so much work that i'm yeah. like Oof. yeah what yeah the the time it took to make changes oh, on my projects god. then wow yeah i can't even really re imagine <laughs> So that's uh, that's great that you had, and I always ask this question because, you know, with many artists that I have interviewed in the podcast and many artists that I work with, I realize that there's normally a little bit of a resistance within their family or their circle of friends when they wake up, they come up with the idea of like, hey, I'm going to study graphic design or I'm going to go down the path of art. So there's a little bit of resistance, uncertainty around the people that surrounds them. And I always ask this because having like the blessing of your parents 
it is kind of important and m perhaps also you will need some financial um, support from them. So um, having a mom that was supportive, I guess, was, was really important for you. And I wonder if you, if you would like to share what was the role of your dad in terms of like supporting you through, through going down the path of art. Did mm. he have any reaction that had... Uh, no, my dad is also like a person who's very free-spirited in some ways mm. and he has himself been doing a lot of poetry. He's not at all like a visual person. Mm. Like all, all my visual... Everything that I'm drawn to visually <laughs> comes from my mom's side. And But my dad has been working like creatively with... Yeah, words definitely in different ways. Um, so he was also very open. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't feel any resistance. I feel, no, just like my mom, as I said, like she has had this kind of more practical approach and my dad is just like, yeah, do do what you want. Mm. Uh, hopefully, you'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So, and then you you went to art school in, I guess, in uh, Sweden, right? Mm. And uh, what came after that? Like, what, what came after, you know, you left art school? What were the steps afterwards that led you towards the path of illustration? I bet there's a lot of... Yeah things happening there but if you can just recall on some of them at least yeah yeah yeah. Uh, yeah I mean for me like I already when I was in kind of like upper secondary school mm -hmm. between 16 mm -hmm. and 19 mm -hmm. I went to a school where we had all the like regular subjects as well but it had a kind of like art and design focus mm. So already there I got the chance to like start exploring a little bit and learning just about yeah different types of art and learning a little bit about art history. And then one of my teachers there she had a daughter that at that point was going to one of the kind of like foundational art schools in Stockholm and she recommended me and a couple of other students to apply there. Uh, so I went two years to this like tiny art school in the middle of Stockholm that was very like classical. It was like, we did, especially during the first year, we did a lot of like model drawings, model painting. Mm. And so really like in a way, stepping away from like the personal expression or at least like the personal, uh, conceptual ideas mm. and just like learning how to yeah how to draw what we saw in in a way that felt good for us and then the second year there was really then we were basically allowed to do whatever we wanted which was really good but also really hard mm -hmm. uh, I think for me in a sense like even though like the model drawing, model painting part wasn't always the most exciting, mm. it was helpful to have that structure in a sense. Mm. And then during the second year when we could basically come and go as we wanted almost and do create whatever we wanted with like painting or drawing or photography or animation, uh, that was a little bit trickier for me to then because then I felt like I... I, I it was, it was good to, you know, explore a lot of different things, but also like harder to stay, um, yeah, stay focused. I think I felt a little bit lost creatively there. Mm. So then after that, I applied, I, I was thinking that I was going to more pursue the part of like painting because that was what I had been doing most during mm -hmm. those years like oil painting and like acrylic painting so I applied to some schools but didn't get accepted um, so I had a couple of years when I was kind of like working I went to Dublin for a while to work in a gallery there and then I was working as a kind of nursing assistant back in Stockholm to save up some money. 
um, and was just basically trying to figure out what to do next if if I should continue trying to pursue this kind of like mm, yeah painting artist route um, but during those years I started also looking into kind of like different creative paths uh, and uh, I applied to study architecture as well and then I kind of started thinking more and more about graphic design and I felt like like I kind of liked this idea of working on creative projects for a client and for other people not only to do that but to have have a little bit more of that like structure and then mm. be able to do like my personal work on the side so yeah so then I applied to this graphic design school in Stockholm and studied there for two years mm. um, but during those two years I ended up doing a lot of illustration which wasn't like we only had like one illustration course that was pretty short but so you I already discovered doing... like a like an interest for illustration during your uh, graphic design studies yeah exactly like I, I ended up using or doing like a lot of illustrations mm. to different kinds of projects during the school years mm. uh, so that I felt like for me illustration kind of became like a natural uh, path in between like that art world and those graphic design studies that that I felt yeah the most drawn to in the end that the, uh, like when I finished my graphic design studies I was like I felt pretty sure that that was what I wanted to focus on the most. That's interesting because I love what you're saying about your own personal journey in finding what is it that you would like doing, right? Because normally we think that this is something that, you know, you're either born with or not, and this is something that should come naturally to you. And actually it's more like, a, well, for most of us, it's more like a process of like finding the things that where you find some joy and what are the things that you're interested in. But it's not always like a, a straight line, right? Um, no. and it seems that in your own story, you had a, a few back and forth and trying to figure out whether that was architecture or acrylic painting or illustration. And I find it really interesting what you say about that working for illustration, like working or doing um, commercial illustration sort of brought some structure to you, right? Because mm. initially you had this idea of doing art or acrylic painting, which sounds like more in the line of fine art. Um, yeah. But yeah, of course, when you work as, a, as an illustrator for clients, then you have that structure, you have the deadlines, you have the briefings, you have some sort of boundaries um, that, you know, define a little bit the framework. Um, and of course, you can create personal work, but you always have that, that structure around, which is really interesting. I never thought of commercial illustration as something that can actually give a framework to mm. your to your creative work yeah no and I feel like this is something that I've been thinking quite a lot about during these years of working as an illustrator that yeah for me obviously not every client project but but overall I feel like I have learned so much mm. from these uh, client projects as well sometimes mm. you know just yeah just having that structure of having to create within certain limits which I like to you know play with sometimes in my personal work as well but obviously it's a lot clearer when the structure is set by someone else and also just sometimes yeah sometimes being pushed a little bit more than I would push myself into testing something new and sometimes it doesn't work obviously and then it can be a little bit frustrating but then it's also really nice when a client yeah pushes you a little bit and it ends up being something that feels really good and that I then later continue exploring with in my personal work maybe mm. or 
yeah, so I feel like, yeah, I get, there's a lot of things that I do in my personal work that I take into my client work, but also the other way around. So you really finished nice. art school and mm. what came after? Were you just leaping into freelancing? Were you getting a job somewhere? What was your, your journey? So there? I had a couple of months when I did like a little bit of freelancing uh, right after I finished this like design education. And then um, then I started to applying to jobs in uh, different agencies in um, in Stockholm, but I didn't really find anything like it was a little bit tricky because of my kind of illustration heavy portfolio. Um, so it, it took me a while to figure something that worked for me. And in the end, that was for like a company based in Malta, a Swedish company that was based there working with gaming. And that was, you know, not the world where I had envisioned myself going to initially but in the end things worked out really well for me in that uh, I think I came into this company like this startup when it was just 30 people there mm -hmm. so I got the chance to you know test a lot of things and get a lot of creative responsibility early on in a different way than I thought think it would have been if I would have come to like a traditional agency hmm. um, and it was like really high roof when it came to ideas that I felt like I could you know make any kind of suggestion for projects and stuff and people would listen and usually we could test things out but initially basically I was working on a big project where I was kind of illustrating uh, yeah a, a parallel universe a different world with like planets and plants and these small little figures that lived in this planet that was part of this game and uh, That's pretty yeah, amazing. it was really <laughs> you know it was a big learning curve for me and very different from everything I had done before yeah and and after this you you went you you went freelance or it took you a couple more jobs to actually do that this was uh, my only kind of creative fixed job but i was there for about uh, almost yeah almost three years mm -hmm. though the last year i worked less hours uh, so that i could focus a little bit more time on my personal project and then I had started doing a little bit of freelance work on the side that last year mm. and and then I was actually in Berlin for <gasps> a while because then I had escaped the yeah Malta became very small after a while so then I escaped to Berlin for a while and then continued on to Barcelona after that <laughs> I see you have relocated a couple of times so I'm gonna dip yeah. deeper into that as well um, later on so I'm going to make a note right now and I'm going to keep that for later. Um, but the I just want to continue like the chronology of, you know, your path into um, freelancing. You were, you know, leaving art school, um, getting a job at a gaming company in Malta. You worked there for three years and you slowly started making... Um, you know, building up your portfolio and your client base on the side. What was, what led you to become a freelancer? What was the, the pursue there? Why, why did you say one day, hey, I, I just want to start building up my freelance business? Mm. What were the motivations behind it? Was it I personal? It was, like was it time? Was it autonomy? Was it doing more of the work you like doing what, what was it? it it was a mix of things it was definitely i i definitely liked this idea of the autonomy of being more in charge of my own time and and be able to 
choose a little bit better on like what I focused on and what I say yeah dedicated myself on doing um but then it was also the just the, the creative expression part that like as I mentioned before that like in this agency like I had a great time you know creating things there but it didn't really feel like my way of expressing myself mm. so also that to be able to just be more more free and to and to do a bigger variety of projects as well mm. like i um, i have learned <laughs> that i'm uh, i i you know i think i have patience in certain things in life but i have learned that I'm not great if I need to work on the same thing for a long time. Mm -hmm. If it's like a project that stretches over several months, I find it hard to keep my interest and creative energy mm -hmm. up enough that then I need to yeah, find other ways to kind of trick myself into in yeah into keeping that kind of energy in the project uh, so for me it was also a way to make it easier to yeah to have a mix of projects to be able to jump a little bit more quicker between different things yeah and also game projects are long right they yes, last a long. lot of years very with a long. lot of um, <laughs> round of changes and stuff so I want to d dive deeper into your experience at living in different places and um so you lived in malta you're from stockholm yeah um, stockholm uh, you moved to malta for because of this job later on you went to berlin um you came to barcelona i'm bar in barcelona right now so that's why i'm saying yeah. you came <laughs> and then um And that you're now thinking of relocating, as you told me before we started the podcast, you're mm -hmm. thinking now of relocating uh, back to Stockholm. So what was also the motivation for you to, to you know, pursue all this different or to relocate to all these different cities? Was that just for fun or were you looking for something else? Uh, it, like each move was a little bit different. Like when I moved to Berlin... I just needed something that was very different from Malta and I needed to be in a place where I could find a lot of other creative people and go to museums and see concerts and yeah, have a little bit more of like a mix of people around me. Um, and I really felt like Berlin was a great place to, for me to be uh, in that sense. In which year Even did you move uh, to Berlin? Which which years? 2016? Wait. Okay. No, 15 maybe. 15. Okay. Yeah. 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 And uh, but then I ended up I, I only ended up staying there for about four months mm -hmm. because then the company at that point I was still working for that gaming company but remotely. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then uh, uh, they were planning to open up an office in Barcelona and asked if I wanted to go there instead. And then since I had been the only one in Berlin, I was like, okay, maybe it's going to be easier to, you know, stay connected to people that I work with if I'm in an office around other people that I work with. And I was interested in Barcelona, so I was like, okay, I, yeah, I visited Barcelona before. I really like the city. I might as well, like, try it out now when I have the chance. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, and then I ended up staying in Barcelona. Uh, <laughs> I definitely think, like, I could have seen myself stay longer in Berlin, but now it was just, yeah, this uh, chance of uh, relocating again. And in Barcelona, I just, yeah, very early on started feeling like this is a place where I can, you know, stay for a while and, and uh, yeah, build, build a life here and, 
as I think you know, like it's a very creative city. It's a good place to be and be around other creative people. And yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah, actually, I'm I'm based in Berlin, so I I've lived in Berlin for twelve years now. Uh, but yeah. I just spent the last couple of months in Barcelona with my kids and just to have the experience. and And I know Barcelona very well. We travel here often, and it is a very, a very in a way, small city. You know, you feel that mm. you can reach every little corner of the city by bike, and at the same time, there's a lot of um, cultural activities and events and uh, a lot of artists living here as well so I, I can imagine why this was a, a nice spot for you to move in and I wonder what were the things that you feel that relocating cities taught you because you know I've, I've interviewed several artists here that have moved or relocated cities for different reasons and many of them um relocated cities because they wanted to leave their comfort zone or they they just wanted to go where the like the work is quote unquote mm. um or to just you know join a creative community so what were the things that you gained through um through living in so many cities and joining so many different communities of art mm. and design I mean, I've definitely, yeah, like moving around like this have taught me a lot about myself mm -hmm. and about other people as well. Um, I think for me, like maybe some of the biggest things is, yeah, like that, that part of pushing myself, like as someone who's both like an introverted person and... Uh, Yeah, someone who, even though I'm not at all as shy as I used to be as a kid, sometimes can still like struggle a bit with that, with like social situations. Like moving has definitely pushed me into having to become a lot more comfortable mm -hmm. with just putting myself out there because, you know, when you're new in a city and you don't know anyone, You don't have any of those like comfort people that you can just hang around with. You need to, you know, get out there and be social and mm -hmm. talk to people mm -hmm. and contact people and companies to to create that kind of community. So like on a personal like in my personal life that has been super helpful. And then also I think like creatively I feel I definitely feel like each place that I've been to has given my creativity something new as well, in a sense. Uh, I don't know if it's just... I usually feel very creative, especially in those kind of like exploration part of being in a new place mm. when you have to be super open and just like try to absorb everything and there are so many new experiences everywhere from like cultural things to mm. all the new people and to just yeah being in a place where you can where you get the chance to connect with other creative people mm. and I think also like the the cultural the culture of each place sits in a little bit as well mm. I feel like there are things that I've just yeah, have picked up in different ways from the different places that I have been, yeah, spending a longer time. And so for me, it's been overall super helpful. And what was, it? ah, yeah, I think also like when it comes to personal things, I feel like whenever you move to a new place, you realize so much when it comes to yourself about what you really want mm. in life or what kind of people you want to surround yourself with, mm. which are like the important things that you need to feel like happy or have stability in your life. Uh, I don't know what your experience was when you moved to Berlin, but for me, I felt like I've, for every move, I've kind of, yeah, By just noticing what are the things that I've missed in another place yeah. and what are the things that I've, I need to 
find early in a new place to make myself feel a little bit more comfortable. Yeah, yeah I, that is really helpful. I can totally relate as someone who relocated cities a couple of times as well. I lived mm. in Barcelona. I lived in The Hague also for a year. I then moved to Berlin where I've been living for the past 12 years. Um, but I can totally relate to this idea of like, you know, the, the different places and the different cultures that you you um you throw yourself in, show you different aspects of yourself. And it's very mm. interesting because in one of the episodes that I recorded with uh, Malika Favre, who also lives in Barcelona, I'm actually going to meet her tomorrow. Um, oh, fantastic. And Say yeah, hi. <laughs> yes, I will. And um, yeah, and she was mentioning that, you know, she re recently relocated to Barcelona while she was living in London for almost a decade. And she mm. comes from... France, Paris, I don't remember exactly which city, but um, she mentioned something that really resonated with me that, you know, while, while London was really formative for her and her career, that was the place where she learned, you know, um, her skills and, and, and her craft. She also, um, she mentioned something like um, London for me in in the sense of like you know it gives you some structure you acquire mm. some of the 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 cultural approach to work for instance and um yeah and she she mentioned that in that episode she mentioned that she why london formed her now she feels in another um stage of her life where she mm. is ready for an environment that looks more like barcelona and the Kind of like the the cultural um, structure that Barcelona gives you in terms mm. of, you know, spending more time um, on the street and, you know, going to the beach and all this stuff, right? So I think yeah. it, it definitely, um, it can definitely have an impact on how you approach work and how you, yeah, how you live your life and... Mm. And at the same time, make you help you discover a lot of different things or um, a different a lot of different aspects of your personality. Like you just mentioned, um, the the thing of moving countries it's already pretty challenging. You have to perhaps learn a new language, find find new friends, uh, make new connections, right? So mm -hmm. there's so much to tackle that it's impossible not to put yourself out there. If you don't put yourself out there, then you better stay where you were, right? So, yeah. <laughs> so I want to just shift gears and just mm. totally take a left turn here, um, which is related to how you started your um, your freelance business or your work as a, you know, how you started to work as a full-time um, artist, right? So you have a big following now on social media. And I read mm. somewhere on some article somewhere that you have received or th this following on social media or that big following on social media help you in the very beginning to to get some client assignments. And I want to dig a little bit deeper into this because I just to give you a little bit of background mm. uh, information of why I'm asking this. I see so many artists focus on growing their following on social media or like obsess into um, mm. you know creating art for Instagram and I sometimes for me it's hard to understand whether that brings any results to their in terms of their success as commercial artists right and as I, I, I read this article that you um, that you wrote or an interview that someone um, did to you um, I was wondering, like, did you actually get assignments through social media? Um, how were your um, your techniques to find out that they were coming through social media? Uh, were you asking? What was, you know, did you have any sort of a statistics writing somewhere in the software or something? <laughs> and also, um, what were other um, other things that you did to to do client reach out or to get the first clients? Mm. I mean, I feel like oof, social media, 
I feel especially like Instagram is so different now mm. than from when I kind of started out. Like I started like, yeah, kind of doing my first freelance illustration projects in, yeah, around that time when I moved to Berlin. So in 2015. So yeah, almost exactly seven years ago. And at that point, I felt like you could, you know, e even if you didn't have a lot of followers, you could still reach people in a different way. So mm. then I, re I really, I felt like at that point I had a really good relationship, if you can say that, with uh, social media and Instagram in particular that I, I enjoyed the process when I had finally started finding that like that kind of authentic way of expressing myself that we talked about initially that I was like oh I want to share this with people mm. that are outside you know outside of my immediate friend group so yeah. I'm gonna put it out here and you know see how people react to it or what happens and during that same time, I send a lot of like emails to magazines or to like smaller like design agencies, different kinds of places where I could see myself doing a project for. So like I did these kind of things simultaneously. Just a follow up but, question here yeah. before we get deeper into this. Uh, what was the email saying? What did you write and what were you, how were you approaching these clients? Yeah, I mean, I I think with the emails, that was probably mostly to, yeah, magazines where I had managed to, like, figure out, like, the name of an art director or something, or some designer in the magazine. And if it was a magazine that I, like, read or followed or that I liked, then it was usually, like, fairly easy to be like, hey, I, you know, I really like what you're doing, I'm... I'm illustrator and it would be really fun to get the chance to work with you someday here is my portfolio or a link to my portfolio and yeah just trying to yeah connect to a lot of people that I felt had like a similar um, yeah creative mm, not exactly creative path than me, but where I could see that my work could possibly, you know, fit in. Mm. Um, but obviously, like uh, many of these mails went unanswered, but I managed to get like some contacts through that, mm. like some small projects that then led to other projects. Um, but I think like what, uh, like what I had said in that article about yeah social media helping me it was like specifically one project that yeah during that first year of freelancing for me I got a request from refinery 29 mm. and they specifically said that we have seen like some of the portraits that you have done that you have posted on Instagram and we wonder if you would want to do some portraits for us mm -hmm. and then I did um, one portrait of Martin Luther King for mm -hmm. Martin Luther King Day and then a portrait of uh, Michelle Obama mm. um, I think that was for like Black History Month or something like that uh, and, uh, and at that point I had also still like very few followers and uh, but those pictures like when uh, refinery 29 posted them they at that point had i don't remember they had a lot of followers so that in itself ended up giving me a lot of more uh, projects based on those two artworks that i did for them so in that sense i felt like it was super helpful for me now I have a lot more, my, my relationship to social media is very different right now. Mm -hmm. Like now I feel like it is, I, I definitely can recognize what you said on like that, that focus on like, 
on seeing that focus on followers in other people and also sometimes getting dragged into it myself depending on how I feel <sighs> yeah where I am in a phase creatively I think mm. usually if I'm, I'm in a good creative phase when I feel very inspired and I just do a lot of things because I enjoy it then it's a lot easier for me to not care about the numbers and the followers or whatever. But if I'm in a phase where I don't feel very creative and yeah, I feel like things are coming a lot harder than <laughs> I want it to come, then I, I, I notice that in myself as well, that I can like start, you know, thinking about... Uh, why are people in, people unfollowing me and and care about that in mm. a different way than I will do when I'm just in a good phase with yeah with myself and my creative work basically that's interesting it seems that social media sort of exacerbates whatever trend you're experiencing as a person and as a creative <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and do you do you continue doing client outreach nowadays Uh, it's been a while since I did that now, but I've actually been thinking that I want to get back to doing that a mm. little bit, just to, both as a way, I think, to disconnect a little bit from uh, the social media world and just take a little bit of time specifically for myself to think about like which specific companies or magazines would I really want to be working with because I think there is something really nice with that just for yourself just to spend that time mm. of beside like outside of your personal work just think of like okay are there any specific clients that I feel like I align with on like what they want to say or what they want to create and then it can be just such a fun process to work together with yeah with a person with a company like that yeah and I feel that sometimes that can be so much more effective to just focus on a couple of people that you want to work with and trying to mm. establish a conversation with them and really create a connection with them as opposed to social media I have nothing against social media I use social media a lot in my business um, mm. however I feel that it's not necessarily a tool um, or it's perhaps not the primary primary tool that artists should use to um, to reach out to clients as I would say that oftentimes the efforts put on social media don't reflect the actual results that that brings to um, to a working artist. And this is why I start questioning like, well, do you really need to spend that much time on social media if it doesn't bring you any mm. results? Um, yeah. What is the real goal behind it? Because exactly. Yeah. It's, It's a, an enormous amount of time that we spend on social media at the end of the day. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it should it should make sense in a way, especially when you're just starting, right? Where you're mm. trying to get those those first clients and um, trying to create those first connections. Sometimes it seems to me, or it has proven to be, um, to be much more effective to just focus on those, on, on a few people you want to work with and really try mm. to connect with those people cons consistently, right? Yeah. So No, I definitely yeah. agree. Mm. Uh, like, I think we reaching out in like a personal way to people you think you feel like you align with. and And I think also that, as you said, like, Connecting in a way like that takes away some of that other, um, yeah, other pressure that comes with social media mm. and like, which is, yeah, this bubble that you can so easily get lost in in yeah. different ways. So I feel like, yeah, yeah, that personal outreach is both, yeah, for, for you personally and for uh, potential new projects to come, like a more straightforward way. 
So you have been working as a full-time freelancer since 2015 or more, I guess. Mm. Right. Yes. So what would you say were or continue to be your biggest challenges as a freelance or as a solo business owner? If you can name a few, what do you think are the things you struggle the most with? Um, I think, well, I know that definitely one thing that I struggle with is that kind of, that part of setting aside enough time for my personal things. Mm. Um, to just, yeah, to create a better structure for that so that I don't put that aside as soon as like a interesting client project comes in or to figure out how to yeah find a better better balance between like my own personal work and the client projects which i have been like working on this last couple of years of just i in general giving myself a little bit more time and space to recover and just do my own things just for fun without them having to you know lead to any specific thing and um, otherwise i mean i for me freelance life suits me very well i'm someone that kind of enjoys working on my own i do i do it is really nice when i get the chance to collaborate a little bit more closely to another creative person um i really enjoy when that happens and it becomes like a fruitful and smooth collaboration um but in my day-to-day -day life i kind of really enjoy being in my own little like bubble creating my things and uh, um, yeah, just diving into my own little world. Then I think now when I'm just in this process again of relocating, obviously like being a freelancer is super, uh, it's really nice in that way that I can easily take my work with me. But then, but you know, all the like, bureaucratical stuff and paperwork mm. of like figuring out how to yeah make things that everything is in order and setting yourself up in a new place i know that that is going to take a lot of uh, time and energy so right now i have that as a little bit of like the the small negative thing in a lot of positives <laughs> so is it is it something that extends to every uh, all the administrative work in your business as well? Is this something that you struggle with, like keeping up? Um... Uh, no, I would say in general, like the administrative part works fairly well, but I think it's also partly because I have like a really good accountant that mm. I, I think that, or at least that for me has been like a key to just be like, okay, I have someone here that I trust that is really helpful whenever I have any question, especially, you know, for me being in Spain, which like now I speak Spanish fairly well, but when I arrived, I basically didn't speak any Spanish. So then it was also really helpful just to be able to understand how things worked mm. when I had to when and where I had to send papers of different kinds. So, but, but when it comes to like timings of things and, um, and overall like keeping track of my paperwork and the, all that administration, I feel like I do that, yeah, fairly well, but, um, but yeah, I, I like when I'm already kind of in a system and understand how that system works and I can just stay to that. Mm. Uh, I know it always like takes a little bit of extra energy when I need to restructure and like understand the new system and yeah, figure these things out. Ah, of course, because now you're going, you know, you're moving countries, so you're you're trying to understand a completely new system on how things work. And this is like, until you have that system, 
and you have that framework in place, then you are kind of like struggling with that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so as we get closer to the end of this episode, Petra, I want to ask you, what are the two things or, or attitudes um, that you feel gave you leverage as an artist and had a big impact on your success? And mm. in a way, allow you to become a full-time freelance uh, illustrator. If you have to name a few or one or two, that, take it any, in any direction, but what are the things yeah. that you feel had, a, had an impact? And you can, yeah. you can take this question as, um, you know, you can take it in direction of like how, how certain decisions or yeah, how certain decisions help you create better work or better um, or more personal work um, or how certain decisions and attitudes help you um, reach out to more clients or um, get more clients or better clients. Mm. You can take it in any direction. I think for me, one of the things that was really important was yeah, I, um, coming back a little bit to, to all those, all, all that time spent just like doing work and exploring, like especially during those years when I was kind of like trying to transition from that graphic design job into freelance illustration, mm. I really like, yeah dedicated a lot of my free time into into trying to discover that way that felt good for me to express myself and and I felt like that that really helped me when it came to like building up a portfolio mm. that I felt happy with to to send to potential clients and to share with other people and that became like a good kind of stepping stone for me um i feel also and this connects also a little bit to that you know the administration that part um like for me i when it comes to like timelines and those things have always been like fairly easy for me to stick with uh, I'm, I'm someone that always prefers if I can be done with something, you know, a couple of days ahead of time in case something, you know, would happen or mm. something. So I, I think for that, for me, you know, once I started having projects to just feel like I could handle working with different kinds of clients well, of making sure that I deliver things on time and that I communicate as well as I can with people mm. and just um, I, I, that is something that I feel has come back to me when it comes to clients recommending me to other clients or to just be you know a nice person that is trying to do yeah, trying to do my best to work together with other people. Um, so for me, like those things together has definitely like helped me build, yeah, build the career that I have today. It's so interesting because I think that you're bringing up two things that are so important that are like two sides of the same coin in a way that you, because oftentimes as artists, we focus so much in, doing work and doing great work and that's mm. that's great that's actually the as you said the stepping stone of everything that comes after but we sometimes forget of all the rest right of like we are working with people you know clients are people we need to understand them we need to be empathetic with the the changes they send and like the their feedback and in a way we need to be professional in the way we deliver our works, right? So mm. it's not enough just to to do great work, but it's also necessary to be, you know, to back it up with a good professional attitude. And I think this is 
this is exactly what you were mentioning right now that it gave you leverage as an artist and to wrap up the the podcast i always like to play a game uh, the game is called finish the sentence <laughs> so <laughs> it is basically i start a sentence and you complete it okay so fantastic. are you ready yeah <laughs> okay so i could never get bored of um joy <laughs> simple <laughs> style is uh, style is Oof. style is what you feel happy in or happy doing I, I guess it depends on like if it comes to like style in the sense of what you wear, how you live, but I think whatever makes you feel happy and confident, that is, yeah, your style. <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed by the fact that I know so little about... Oof. Uh, history, when it comes to... Uh, uh, yeah, history, I, in the grand scheme of things, like I, I, I can like, you know, go down on some specific events, but then if someone asks me like, if I need to place certain things in like a time order or when it happens or in which century was this, then yeah, th those have led to some embarrassing moments. <laughs> <laughs> If I wouldn't be doing this for a living, I would be... I think I would probably do something with animals. Mm. Uh, it could be probably be a really, a really nerdy animal scientist of some kind. Like, a, I don't know, a whale scientist out on a boat somewhere. <laughs> I'm always chosen first when it comes to... Um, what am I chosen chosen first for? Um, it, I mean, oof, yeah, in my group of friends, it might be some kind of, well, either art related thing or strength related thing because I like doing a lot of strength workouts and but though if you get to like my kind of yeah 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 probably those two <laughs> right now is the perfect time to oh relax <laughs> thank you so much Petra for being on the podcast today where can people find you people can find me well at either instagram at petra erikson studio or yeah, my website, petraeriksson.com. Uh, and yeah, people are very welcome to reach out if they have any specific questions from the podcast or yeah, something else that they just want to ask about or discuss. Amazing. I will add this to our show notes so that listeners can find you. Thank you again for all the insights Perfect. and wisdom thank that you, you shared so today. Much, Martina. <laughs> and thank you everybody for listening. See you on the next episode of Open Studio. Bye bye. Bye bye. So this is it. I hope you loved this episode. You can find me, the host of the show, on social networks at Martina Flor on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. If you have a question or comments, go to martinaflor.com slash podcast where you can see previous episodes, find show notes, and send voice memos with your comments and questions. You can also watch these episodes on YouTube. Just go to martinaflor.com slash YouTube to find them. You can, of course, listen to all our episodes on your favorite podcast platform. If you loved this episode, subscribe to this podcast. And if you leave us a review, it will help others find us. Thank you all for listening and see you in the next episode of Martina Flores Open Studio. Bye-bye.